Good morning, Faith Family Chapel, and uh, welcome to your online message today. Uh, appreciate the fact that you guys are being uh, very patient in this whole COVID thing. There's not a whole lot uh, we can do about that. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll all be together next week. Uh, so uh, we, we have to kind of keep our eyes and ears open to what uh, Rhode Island is going to do about it. But um, thank you for being online with us this morning. So we're going to continue today in our discussion on parables, and we're going to be talking about the parable of the tenants. And we're going to start with our scripture for this morning. It's out of Luke 20, and it's verse 17 through 18. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone whom it falls will be crushed. Father, we thank you for the words that you provided us. We thank you for the message. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. So the cornerstone, uh, it's an important feature. You're going to find uh, references to the cornerstone in both the New Testament and the Old Testament, um, and they're always pointing toward Jesus. Jesus is called the, the cornerstone. Well, let's look at it from an architectural perspective, right? So in construction of any kind of masonry or, or stone, there are typically three major stones. There's a capstone, a keystone, and a cornerstone, okay? Uh, the capstone is typically also known as the coping. It's the very last stone that is put down, uh, it, and it makes it look pretty, and it protects the stones from uh, on the very top and protects all the masonry. The keystone, the keystone is a wedge stone, and it's typically used in arches or entryways, uh, and it's basically there to, to uh, send all of the weight of the stone down the side so that the opening uh, can be made without any issues, right? So that the keystone handles the weight and, and uh, disperses it down each side evenly. But the, the stone we're talking about is the cornerstone. And the cornerstone is the most important stone in stone masonry uh, because of the fact that it's the very first stone that is laid out. So before the building is created, the cornerstone has been made perfectly. It's perfectly square. It's put in the very perfect space in order so that the rest of the building will be built exactly the way the uh, builder had intended. Okay, So it's a very, very important stone, um, and I think that's why uh, they reference Jesus. Everybody would have understood the importance of that particular stone. In uh, the Greek, the cornerstone would be called lithos, right? Uh, and it basically just means a stone, or you'll see maybe in some Greek definitions, the stone, meaning it's a very important, it's the stone, right? Uh, and it typically means also Jesus as the chief stone in a building. So we're going to be, as I said, in the parable of the tenants. Uh, it's a very important parable because, again, it's found in all three of the Gospels. So there must be a reason why they're asking us to look at all three of these Gospels. So we have it in Matthew, we have it in Mark, and we have it in Luke. So we're going to start, though, I thought would be in Matthew to try to give you kind of an understanding of what the setup is. Why did Jesus all of a sudden go into this parable of the tenants, right? He didn't just show up and go, hey, let me tell you this. No, there was there's a story behind that. So let's talk about that. We'll pick it up in Matthew 21, verse 1. And as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. So this is, you know, scripture that's foretold that essentially Jesus is going to uh, ride in to Jerusalem uh, on a donkey. The Savior will be entering Jerusalem on a donkey. He will be heralded and let everybody know that he's royalty, right? So this is the way that's becoming up, and he gets set to do that. And it says in verse 9, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So he's getting all the accolades from all of the people. They are recognizing him as Lord. They are recognizing him as Savior. They are recognizing him as royalty. Okay, so this is all going on as he's entering Jerusalem. And then he goes on in verse 12, it says, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. 
Okay, so basically what's happened in that point in time is that the temple has become like a uh, flea market. Uh, you can walk in and trade for just about anything that's there. Um, and you, you're, there would be uh, money changers and uh, people that were selling you uh, animals that you would sacrifice and, and other things were going on there. Um, but Jesus went in and turned the whole thing upside down. It's one of the areas where we see Jesus uh, with some righteous anger is what we'll call, I'd like to call it. That was righteous anger. But he's definitely made it known that that's not what the temple is supposed to be about. And then it goes on in 14, it says, The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, thank you, uh, when the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were delighted and overjoyed. Uh, no. That's not what it says, right? It says they were indignant. Well, how is that possible? Well, because... They were there. They saw all that was taking place. They were, they were very educated in the law. They were very educated by the prophets. They knew exactly what Jesus was pointing to. They knew exactly that Jesus was basically saying, hey, I'm the, I'm the salvation. I'm the king of kings. I'm the new guy. And they were very, very concerned about their own power and their own position that they held. And they were indignant. So this is what sets up the parable of the tenants discussion because they now come to Jesus and challenge him on his authority and they they challenge him on who he really is and so he's going to get ready to let them know who he is but before we get into that I want you to kind of get an idea so you get a preference on or uh, you get some background on, on the the players that are going to be in this in this story right there's going to be a landowner and he represents God there's going to be the vineyard, and this is the kingdom. This is the kingdom of God that is being established. The tenants, the tenants are the specifically the Israel's religious leaders and all who reject them. So basically the tenants are the, are the current leaders of the day. The servants, the servants of, are God's prophets and faithful believers. These are, these are people that have gone before Jesus and basically shared the good news of Jesus and his coming. And then the beloved son is obviously Jesus Christ, right? So that gives you the idea of who these people, who Jesus is speaking of as he's talking to um, the, the uh, teachers of the law. All right, we're going to pick this up in Luke 20. Luke 20, verse 9. It says, He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. Now, Side note, this is very common. This is what would have happened. So rich guys would go into uh, an area and they would buy a bunch of land and then they would basically um, rent it to people who would take care of it and farm it and, and uh, you know, harvest whatever they were growing. And he would get a, a portion of that harvest. Okay, so that, that was very, very common. And goes on in verse 10. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. This would have been pretty straightforward business. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Uh, yeah, that's not good. Uh, so uh, the, um, uh, the rich man basically sent another servant. But that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. He sent out still a third servant and they wounded him and threw him out. So essentially... The man who who basically owned the vineyard is sending to the tenants of the vineyard requests for his, you know, his his pay, right? His portion of the harvest. And instead of them being good tenants, they basically, you know, because the uh, man is not there, right? Just the servants, they decide, yeah, we're not doing that. And they keep beating up the servants that come and refuse to give them any of the harvest. So the owner of the vineyard says, what shall I do? Oh, I know. I'll send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. And, and it's the son whom I love is kind of interesting wording that would have been used that Luke picked up. And you would have found the son whom I love also at what? Yeah, the baptism of Jesus. This is my son who I love. Right? This is a wording that would have gotten around. People would have understood that phrase, uh, perhaps. And so it should have kind of went, ching, 
You guys need to pay attention. We're talking about God and we're talking about Jesus. But in any event, the owner, God, sends his son, Jesus, and, they, and he hopes that they'll respect him. Verse 14, but when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. There's more going on here than meets the eye. So in, the, in that particular time, if a uh, rich guy owned a piece of property but died without an heir, that property would go to the tenants who were working the property. You get the idea? So the tenants are like, listen, if we kill off the heir and the guy and the rich guy dies, we're going to end up with this, this uh, piece of property and not him. So this gets kind of, this gets kind of uh, underhanded here. So they've decided it, that they're going to kill him because it's in their best interest. So Jesus then turns and asks the, you know, the teachers of the law, the ones that he's challenging with his parable, he says, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? And he answers. He doesn't wait for them. He answers and he said, he will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to the others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. That would be, that, would, that wouldn't happen. God forbid. And Jesus continues he, in 17. He goes, Jesus looked directly at them and asked, then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on it, whom it falls, will be crushed. This is a complete salvation message and something you and I should be paying attention because it's not only written to those that don't know who Jesus is, it's written to those who know who Jesus is. Remember, he is communicating with the teachers of the law. They should already know who Jesus is. So this is not written to predominantly those that don't know him. This is written for those that know him. You and I know him, right? So understand, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. So when you and I have realized what a sinner we are and the fact that we require a Savior, we basically are broken. We become broken and we become humble, and we become teachable, and we become disciples. But anyone who does not become broken, anyone who does not understand the message, well, it says anyone on, on whom it falls will be crushed. So if you're listening to the message, but you don't get it, yeah, Jesus at some point will come back and judge you, and you will be crushed. And the intention here is you don't go to heaven you end up in a fiery pit with the rest of those who chose not to follow Jesus. Yeah, so which side are you on here, listener? Are you, are you the Christian who has recognized that they can't get to heaven on their own and that they have to choose Jesus? Or are you the non-Christian or the fake Christian, the one who knows about Jesus but has decided to try to make it on your own and, and you're not going to accept him as your Lord and Savior? See, that, that's, that's the balancing act here. Which one are you? And so this is written to both Christians and non-Christians. And the Sadducees and the, the Pharisees, yeah, they got the message. They knew the message. It says in 19, it says, The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. He knew, they knew that he had spoken this against them. They were the tenants, and the servants that were coming were the um, prophets, and all those God sent ahead to talk about Jesus. And then they saw the son coming, who was Jesus, and they killed him because they wanted to run things. They wanted to be the head of the vineyard and not God. They got this message loud and clear. There is no doubt based on this message that they understood exactly who Jesus was. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying. And at the end, they decided that their position and their authority was more important than obeying the Son of God. 
The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. And the only reason why they didn't do it was because they were afraid of the people around them. They were afraid of all of the people that watched Jesus come in on the donkey. They hailed him as Lord, Savior. They saw the miracles. They were calling him salvation. And the teachers of the law and the chief priests were afraid for their own lives that if somehow they turned on this Jesus, they would be killed by the mob. So they tried to find a different way of doing it. And we know that what he, they did was they basically set him up and, and essentially with one of his friends, one of his disciples, uh, and they accused him, crucified him, and hung him on a cross just because they didn't want to give up their position. They didn't want to give up their power. They didn't want to give up themselves to God. They didn't want to make Jesus Lord and Savior. So I'm going to ask you today, those of you that are listening, where are you in this? Where are you? Are you fully committed to letting Jesus be the Lord of your life? Or are you still being the Lord of your life? Are you still acting like the teachers of the law and the chief priests, and you are not letting him take over your life. You are not letting him control you completely. Because the end on that is you don't get out of jail, you don't go to heaven, you end up in the fiery pit. This parable has as much importance to those that were listening then as they do today. I don't know where you are at, but I know for me, it makes me take pause. How much am I unwilling to allow Jesus to be the king of kings? I think it's something we all have to think of as we contemplate our week, and I would ask you to do that. So, Father, we thank you for the message that you gave us this morning. We ask that you be with us uh, the rest of the week, that you allow us to contemplate our own lives. Where are we? What, how is our pride getting in the way? Help us understand that we truly desire a Savior in order to be free. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.